All right. Um, so first of all, uh, some uh, organizational points. Everybody handed in? Yes? OK. Um, it's next week, um, I think it's the week of December 2nd, um, this will be the last teaching week for this course. Because the week after that, I have to do, I'm teaching in India so for a week. So I'll be teaching next week, and I'll t we'll try to finish the course next week. So I'm, we'll, I'll know by Monday whether we need uh, an extra uh, class. But I'll, I'll, I'll probably be able to tell by Monday. Uh, and so next week will also be the last quiz, as usually, on, on Thursday. Okay. Right, and as, as we had said, um, there will be no final exam. I'll just uh, use your quizzes. Um, uh, to, uh, to get the final results. Right, okay. So, uh, a few things uh, that um, I, I haven't put up the, uh, the final uh, slides, version of the slides uh, for the for the precipitation strengthening um, on E-class. But um, anyway, um, some slides I amended. Uh, one of the slides that I amended is the relation between the um, remember this, this very interesting relation here that we found which, which connects the uh, spacing between the particles oops, and the, the radius and their volume fraction, right? So that's a very useful relation to, to use in practice. Um, right, so this is an example here. If, if, if you use it, if you have a volume fraction of uh, 10 to minus 2, yes? Um, okay, this is, vo by the way, this is volume fraction, right? So maximum value is 1, not 100, okay? This, um, so this is 1%. F0.01 is 1%. So uh, that means you have uh, L will be 14 times the particle uh, radius, for instance. Um, now, OK, this is the basic equation. You can use it, um, as I said, um, uh, if you have low volume fractions, that's fine. Um, and of course, um, there are lots of simplifying assumptions in uh, when we uh, computed it. So, um, and there are more correct uh, equations. Um, so one of them is, is shown here, yes, um, which uh, is, a, is a better approximation. So again, if you apply this formula uh, here, uh, you can see that um, for uh, you get uh, 16 times uh, uh, the uh, radius of the uh, precipitate for the if you have a volume fraction of one percent, um, and I would and I also give you an equation that's uh, similar. It's um, it gives very similar results than the previous one, but this is actually the correct. One, you know, if you want to be absolutely correct and, and not make shortcuts, this is the one you should use. Yes, um, and um, uh, so I've taken the um, notation where the uh, where we use the uh, the diameter instead of the radius. This D is diameter here, and um, so say you um, by TM measurements, for instance, you are able to determine uh, the particle sizes, yes? Mm -hmm. um, you can calculate the mean value of the particle size, yes? And then you so make a column, particle uh, diameter, and then you make a column with the squares of these, yes, of the measurements. And then the cube of these measurements, and then you measure the mean value of these three columns, yes? And that gives you the mean value of the diameter, the mean value of the square of the and the mean value of the 
cube of the particles. Yeah? And then you substitute this into this, and that will give you a, um, the, the, you know, the absolute correct, uh, stereologically correct value. Okay? So if you don't want to, um, you know, like in your PhD, for instance, um, that's the formula I would use. Of course, the, uh, the problem is, in order to get this, be able to use this value, you need to have, you know, to, to have measurements of d, you know, and if you don't have that, right, then you use the simple formula, which will give you a values that are close enough. Hmm? All right. So everything depends on your particular situation, which formula you want to use. Are you going to find big differences? Not. Yes. Um, is it going to matter a lot with the type of data you'll be able to get? Probably not. But it's a nice, you know, if you have. Uh, uh, you know, measurements of actual particle diameter that you get, for instance, from extraction replicas uh, with TM. Well, this is a nice um, um, uh, way to measure it. Of course, um, how many should you measure? Nowadays, you can do automated measurements, so you can measure hundreds of particles, so you get good statistics, um, if you can make good samples, of course. And um, uh, Right, so that's basically what I wanted to say about this, this formula. Oops, sorry. So we, we discussed this. I don't have anything uh, different to say. Right. Um, so uh, we had said that, you know, if we introduce particles in the matrix, hmm, so it's important here we're talking about particles in the matrix. Hmm, so this is the grain, yes. The particles should be in the matrix. And uh, two things can happen. Either the particles can pass, excuse me, cannot pass the, the particles, yes, and then we have uh, bypassing, yeah? or the dislocations can go through the particle, okay? And, and we had, we were talking about, the, we were discussing, so the, the particle gets sheared by the dislocation. Hmm? And of course, uh, the, the uh, force that the obstacle, the particle, will have exert on the dislocation will depend on the shearing process. And, and so we had discussed modulus hardening and uh, in some depth. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll review this. But there are other uh, uh, possible hardening mechanism: stacking fault hardening, order hardening, chemical hardening, and coherency hardening that are possible. Hmm? So we'll go, um, uh, we'll, we'll first review what we found for modulus hardening, see, uh, look at the system where, where it's uh, uh, being used, and it's, uh, we've already introduced that, that's copper and iron, yes? And, um, and then we'll discuss uh, a bit more quickly the other, part of, the, the other hardening mechanism. So uh, just uh, repeating here, modulus hardening is when you have the precipitate has a different uh, modulus than the uh, dislocation, yes? And we, uh, so do we, do we had to review the theory again. Okay, uh, I've, I've added this here in the back. It's, just, it's kind of theoretical background and it's kind of interesting to know because of the equations uh, you'll get. So you, you know, you're not supposed to uh, uh, learn this in uh, by heart in any way, but um, it's a derivation that uh, basically shows you, right, and it's, it's hidden here, but that in the particular situation that we encounter uh, often, yes, is that the, the hardening effect that you will get from the cutting here, yes, will be proportional to the, the maximum uh, uh, force that the uh, obstacle exerts on the dislocation to the power V halves. Yeah? And so that's um, shown how you, uh, you get that specific power um, in, in the slide here. And so remember that because uh, just in case you're wondering why when we go through the different uh, uh, formulas, uh, why there's always this power through three halves there, 
you can find it back here. It's, it's basically simple math, yes. And that is related to this, so the, the simple model of, which is called Friedel model, Friedel statistics model, that's what, uh, when, when a dislocation pass through a, an array of obstacles, you get some kind of steady state that each time when that the dislocation advance by uh, uh, passing one obstacle and getting caught on an, the next obstacle, yes? So the, uh, the dislocations move um, like that. Hmm? And um, so that allows you to do some simple geometrical calculations, which we call Friedel statistics. Hmm? Right? And then if you apply this, you find that you find uh, the critical uh, shear stress, which is the, the, which is the maximum uh, retaining uh, uh, force that the obstacle has on this way to the power three halves, okay? And, yes, okay. Right, so let's uh, go on. Right. So we, we, we've been talking about the, the copper precipitation now, right, as an example of modulus strengthening. And, uh, and I had reminded you of the fact that the strengthening effect is related to the uh, reciprocal of the distance. So that's a really important parameter. The smaller I make it, the larger I get uh, strengthening. And the cosine of the breakaway angle, yes? So the breakaway angle tells me something about F max, basically, yes? Um, and uh, its maximum value uh, is uh, for the breakaway angle zero, yes, is one, okay? All right, and so we had gone through uh, the theory, yes? And, um, and the result, yes, and this is, this is how you have to imagine the, uh, the dislocation going through this particle when there is a difference in, um, in modulus. What it means is that I have a difference in, um, in um, uh, dislocation tension, yes, this T value here, yes, and finally we get, okay, we get this equation here, right? This equation here is, um, all right, and it tells me that uh, the strengthening is uh, proportional to 1 over L, the distance between the, uh, the copper precipitates, and then this factor here, square root of 1 minus the ratio of the modulus of the particle and the matrix, and, all right? Okay, again, um, so some of you, I don't know, maybe for your research or something, you'll, you know, you'll go into the literature and, and you'll see, well, um, the, you know, I can't find this equation or is this, obviously this equation is a simplification, yes? Um, and one of the things that is simplified here is, and it's very often simplified in the elementary theories, is we don't take into account um, the fact that uh, the line tension is in practice not equal to GB square divided by two, right? But it's, it's a more complicated function. It's a function of what type of dislocation I have, et cetera. Mm? So this is the actual uh, equation. It's, it, we've seen it before, it's just if you don't remember. So for instance, if you have a screw dislocation, this equation becomes, becomes this, right? And um, there is this factor here, this mysterious factor, which is always a problem, um, is the, the natural logarithm of r over r0, right? R, r being the, 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 the distance, basically, uh, between dislocations, and how, how far does the um, influence of a dislocation extend? So it's kind of really difficult uh, uh, parameter to, 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 to define and divided by R0, that's the, that's the size of the core of the dislocation, yes? Mm -hmm. So in this uh, particular case, well, for R, you just take the distance between the particles, mm -hmm. that's very reasonable, and 
Um, and for R0, is, you find uh, two times the Burgers factor is a good value. Uh, surprisingly enough, you know, it looks like a factor that will have a big impact. Actually, it's a factor that doesn't have such a big impact. So it's, it's, um, uh, that's why um, working with GB square over 2 very often works surprisingly well in practice. Hmm? But anyway, uh, uh, this would be this would definitely be uh, the equation uh, to use uh, uh, again if you would be involved in research. And of course there are added complications. Uh, the dislocations are curved, yes? So they're not really purely edge or purely um, a purely edge or purely uh, screw dislocations. Um, our lattice but certainly iron is not isotropic, so uh, uh, this, this here we assume by using one value for G that the lattice is isotropic, yes? So it, that's not the case, yes? Um, and, and then um, uh, uh, when you have a strengthening uh, situation in the lattice, uh, it may not be the only one, and that's very often the case. You have, for instance, as we've seen for copper, you, copper will have an impact as a solid solution strengthening and as a precipitate, yes? So how do you account for both of these strengthening effects which occur at the same time? So, and that's in addition to the, the way in the models you approach the geometry of the, of the problem. Hmm? Okay, so that's, uh, having said this, um, you know, you can look at this, the equation we have for copper uh, for, for general uh, modulus strengthening. So this is the delta tau, and you see that for a, a constant uh, L, G, and B, so if this is constant, yes, a constant value, it depends only on this, on the ratio of the uh, modulus uh, of precipitate and matrix, and you see that if, uh, if I have a very low um, uh, precipitate modulus, so very soft modulus, a very soft precipitate, I'll get, actually get a very strong hardening. Hmm? So that's why copper in iron is a strong hardener, is because it's, it's actually because it's soft, yes? Hmm? And, um, and I can also, uh, from the same model, hmm, get the critical angle, yes? And uh, so uh, if, if I have very soft uh, precipitate, hmm, uh, that means that at breakaway, the, the dislocations will look like this, right? The, the, this, this angle here, the uh, 2 times phi uh, C, is uh, close to zero. Hmm? Whereas, if uh, the particle has a modulus very close to that of the matrix, uh, there's not much strengthening, and the angle is, is very large at breakaway. Hmm? Now, if we look at copper and iron, yes? Um, and you make the ratio of the copper and the iron modulus, it's about 0.62, yes? So that means that I have a considerable, I expect a considerable amount of strengthening, yes? And a, a breakaway angle that should be somewhere around 80 degrees uh, for that particular, um, uh, if, we, if I use that particular theory, hmm? okay? Okay, so first of all, um, uh, you could check, is, is the theory basically close to what you get in practice? Hmm? Hmm? Uh, how good is the theory? Hmm? So first of all, you see the theory tells me that the strengthening effect hmm, is proportional to the square root of the volume fraction, yes? So, and the volume fraction is something I can easily calculate, yes? I, I don't even need to make an experiment. I just assume all the copper is uh, precipitated, yes? And, um, and, and so, yes, you can see uh, pretty uh, regular uh, line uh, linear relation. The uh, formula, al uh, excuse me, the um, uh, theory also uh, tells us that the strengthening should be proportional to 1 over L, the interparticle spacing. Yes, and um, this is uh, uh, the situation here. So the, here I have a reciprocal of the um, uh, uh, interparticle, interprecipitate spacing for different amounts of uh, volume fractions. And you see I get a nice 
linear equation. So, uh, you know, the, the, the theories that we have for modulus hardening are pretty good. Uh, so this is the reciprocal of the length, so that means um, uh, on this side I have coarse particles, yes? So the uh, precipitation is, oops, this is right, I need to, I, you probably don't have this slide, but I, I see here this is not volume fraction, but this is strength uh, effect here. Um, uh, so on this side we have large uh, particles, low strength, on this side we have uh, small particles, small spacing, small particle spacing, and uh, we have a much higher strength. And, and these are typical values, right? 50 nanometers to 200 nanometers. So um, it's going to, uh, precipitation hardening really needs really fine microstructures. You know, we're not talking about microns here, yes? We're talking about nanometers about 100 nanometers in distance between precipitates. That's the kind of distances. And the precipitates themselves, well, let's have a look at some more data here. OK, well, right, so again, we already discussed this, that uh, we have to take, if you want to take data, uh, you need to uh, take off the solid solution hardening by the copper. Uh, we also discussed how last uh, uh, Monday how uh, you make this precipitation by supersaturation. And this, this is kind of a number of uh, results here. That's where we stopped on Monday. So you have the aging time. Mm -hmm. And you can measure, um, you, uh, of course, you can measure yield strengths and tensile strengths, etc. An easier way to get lots of data uh, without having to make too many samples is measuring the hardness, right? And, um, and you see at 1% of um, uh, copper, uh, I have a peak hardening here at about, uh, at about this time here, 10,000 seconds, yes. If I have more copper, yes, I reach the peak aging uh, at uh, about this 100, 200, but uh, this is 200, 400. 400 seconds, mm. um, so a few minutes, I, I get peak aging around here. Yeah. Before this, um, uh, the material is said to be over, uh, underaged, so I have an increase in the, in the strength. After that, it's, the material is overaged, yes? Um, usually, uh, this transition, yes, in, in uh, introductory uh, material science mechanics test um, is uh, defined as a transition between uh, particle cutting and particle bypassing. It doesn't have to be that way. So uh, cl classically when the, the, this, this theory is presented, yes, uh, people say, well, you know, uh, when you reach the maximum of hardening, yes, that is because at this stage uh, the dislocations, the particle has is, is become so big, yes, that the dislocation will bypass the, the particle. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it goes down, yes. It doesn't have to be this way. In particular, in this case, in the case of a copper, um, you reach the, the maximum, and after reaching the maximum, you're still cutting through the particles, right? And it's only at much higher uh, uh, overaging times that you get uh, what, what is called uh, the bypassing of the particles by the dislocations. Um, right, and you can see here, there's some nice data here, of the kinetics of the coarsening. Mm? And uh, so you see here, this is 5 nanometers, yes? So this is 10 nanometers, yes? So. Um, your, um, your, the peak aging is obtained when you have the particles are fine enough, right? That's important. Um, uh, okay, and then of course you can always translate your, uh, your strengthening effects that you measure uh, by hardness uh, to a, a strengthening effect that you would measure in, in a tensile test. And this is the, uh, remember, the formula we saw earlier. So you you, uh, you use the hardness 
in Vickers in megapascal, yes, and divide by three. Hmm? Don't use the formula that you multiply with, with three, yes, because that's, that's another uh, uh, way of using your hardness data. So if you do this, you see here uh, our, our strengthening effect. So this one is not corrected. The data here is not corrected for solid solution hardening. So I need, I, I have to take my starting value here and then uh, look at this distance here. And that is about one, one uh, gigapascal, so 1,000 megapascal divided by three. It's about 333 megapascal increase in strength uh, by adding two mass percents of copper. So it's a considerable amount of strengthening. Yes, it's a considerable amount of strengthening, right? So no, no wonder that um, uh, people uh, uh, will use uh, copper to uh, strengthen. It, it, um, it doesn't have negative, uh, it doesn't have negative impact on other mechanical properties. For instance, in terms of uh, toughness, it's, it, the toughness is not uh, uh, influenced uh, negatively by the addition of copper. The only problem there is, is when you make the steels. At high temperature, the copper tends to form liquid films along grain boundaries, yes? And so materials can literally break when you're trying to process, process them. So, so actually steel makers hate copper. Hmm? And we try to make sure that we don't put copper in any of our steels, yes? Unless, uh, but, but the method is used. So you, you, know, you, you do have copper added steels um, but usually for uh, sheet products uh, and other, many other you know, high volume products, you, do, you, stay, you generally stay away from copper additions hmm? for precipitation strengthening hmm? because of the steel making. Okay, so now um, let's, ha let's have a look at uh, some other data here. Hmm? So in this case, we do have uh, uh, the, the strengthening effect in, in megapascal from a tensile test, yes? So, um, and uh, I've already converted the data as a function of precipitation, precipitate radius, but in, in this direction you could also have aging time. And what you see, I reach a maximum, yes? And then uh, a decrease, I, I overage, the materials overage, yes? So what, how can I use this data, yes? So you can use this data actually uh, cleverly, you can say, okay, in this case, it's only the strengthening, right? So we took away all the other st strengthening contributions, solid solution, uh, the piles strength, the effect of the grain size, etc. Yeah. So we have pure precipitate strengthening. And nicely, um, uh, we find the peak hardening is indeed around 300 megapascal, like we, we calculated for the hardness, yes? Just a while ago. So what can we do here? We measure uh, this delta sigma, so it's about 300 uh, megapascal, and you know I can always convert tensile data into shear data by using my uh, Taylor factor. So, th so for, by measuring this, I can calculate the increase in the shear strength from um, uh, due to precipitation hardening. Okay, now I, I know how much copper I added, so I can calculate the volume fraction of copper in my, because copper, I remember, remind you, is not really soluble, yeah? so most of it will form a precipitate, so I can calculate the volume fraction, and I can measure the radius of the precipitates. Hmm? Uh, simply, you know, as I said, you, you, you make your samples, you put them in the TM, and you just measure, yes? Um, so you can calculate the, the critical angle for, um, for uh, breakaway. Hmm? So you can do this, and indeed, uh, this is what you find. If, if the particles are very small, the angle is 180 degrees. Uh, right, uh, uh, this angle, two, two times this angle is, is uh, 180 degrees. Uh, yes, and, and then as the particle uh, increases in size, it goes, it decreases, right? Because the angle, uh, am I saying this right? 
Yes, so, 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 here, so yeah, here, here is a soft particle, and then it increases. Uh, the angle uh, decreases as the particle becomes larger. And, um, and I can calculate the, the maximum force also. So as the angle decreases, the force has to increase. Okay? The, uh, what this was, remember, copper iron. So the, the angle, the critical angle, should be about 80 degrees, yes? So let's see if we reach 80 degrees. No, we never reach 80 degrees, yes? We reach 80 degrees. This is 90 degrees, right? So we're, we're still above. Uh, so that means the dislocations can continue to cut the particles, yes? Even though we're beyond the peak aging. Uh, what else can I say? Oh, yeah, so what's also important is where do we get the peak aging and why do we get the peak aging? Well, you see, apparently, it's related to the structural change in the particle. You, you remember I said when the particles uh, uh, form uh, very small clusters, they're BCC, and then, then, they, then they change into uh, other uh, types of crystallography before becoming FCC, well, you can see that we reach the peak aging when we have tiny clusters of copper uh, uh, iron uh, particles, yes, um, which are body-centered cubic. So that that's appears to be the, uh, the reason why we have this, this peak aging. All right. Uh, right, so, so just to... Um, so a few more things. Uh, so BCC copper is a, a modulus effect, yes? Uh, so it's a soft particle, so we get uh, it's an attractive uh, obstacle. Um, in the TM analysis, um, people have reported that um, they don't see loops around the particles. Um, so when I, when the, um, the breakaway angles are, so the, the phi angle here is very, very small, and close to zero. Um, the, the bypassing should give me particles with loops around them, yes? And for every uh, dislocation, another loop, yeah? So that's how you can tell experimentally if, um, if you have cutting or bypassing of the precipitate. So the TM showed that um, uh, there is no bypassing uh, if the precipitate is less than 35 microns. And the peak is at 5 microns. So it's way beyond the, the, the maximum, uh, the peak aging that you get, uh, s that, that the uh, bypassing process starts. Hmm? So dislocation bypassing, uh, very low angles here. Um, takes place when the particle radius is larger than 35 millimeters, uh, 35 microns. Eh? And there is also no work hardening in the overage condition. That basically means the same thing. You, you don't accumulate dislocations. Um, right, and then, uh, so, yeah, so, so I need to go back here. Um, yeah, the, the way this, is, this diagram is uh, done is a little bit confusing. It's... Um, it's because the, the, the uh, so it should go from, let's see, right, no, it's, it's correct. It should go from high to low. Okay. Right, so, um, so what, what you basically have is as the particle becomes coarser, yes, um, the, the, the critical angle is, and this is not too phi, but uh, phi itself, yes, uh, decreases, yes, and I go from particle uh, cutting eventually to uh, particle bypassing, but only after 35 uh, nanometers, so long after the, um, the uh, peak strength, okay? Right, so let's, let's uh, quickly overview now the, the strengthening other strengthening mechanisms. So we have uh, another uh, mechanism is coherency strengthening. Uh, differences in volume between particle and matrix, uh, yes, matrix volume that it replaces, will give us elastic 
stresses acting on the matrix. Hmm? And so we, one of the reasons why that happened is because if there is a difference in lattice parameter, there's actually a difference in lattice in um, at atomic radii, and we can change this into, or we can connect this with lattice parameters, yes? Hmm? And then, and define a, a parameter delta, which control this coherency uh, hardening, and that's basically lattice strain. Yeah. So we, we, this delta is the lattice parameter of the particle minus lattice parameter of the matrix divided by the lattice parameter of the matrix. And, and so we usually, and then we, for the theory, we need to, um, of, of coherency strengthening, we have to use a misfit parameter epsilon. Yes? And if you look up in the literature, uh, you find pretty complex equations for this uh, parameter. So it's equal to delta times, uh, for instance, uh, this parameter here, where G is the, the shear modulus and, and, uh, and, you, and this is the Poisson modulus. Uh, the thing is, very, if, you know, if you go through this, you see that um, uh, the Poisson modulus is typically about uh, 0.3, so this is um, so the 1 minus 0.3 is 0.7 times 2 is 1.4, yes? And this is uh, 1 plus the modulus is 1.3. So this is, yes, um, uh, usually you can just forget this, this parameter here. Hmm? Okay? So it's um, very uh, uh, quickly simple to relate. Um, uh, so, so this goes away, and and this goes away. So you can relate this epsilon to I, I made a, I forgot the parameter to to uh, delta. Yes. So usually you can simplify this uh, one plus one. Okay. All right. So um, so. The maximum interaction force, by theory, uh, I, I, do, I don't derive it here, is related to the, uh, this, the strength of the mismatch. Large mismatch is, increases the um, uh, interaction force. And then, uh, if you go through the theory, most of the theories end up with a strengthening effect, um, which is proportional to this coherency effect to the power three thirds, the three halves, three halves, yes, and the square root of F times the mean particle diameter, yes? Okay? And, and so this is what we know uh, to be the case for um, precipitates hardening, and, and this is uh, what I told you uh, that in the case of precipitation hardening, we get the maximum interaction force to the power two thirds. So in practice, um, for instance, yes, uh, this would be a formula uh, which is derived from this one that you would use in practice, hmm? where uh, uh, the reason why it looks so different, it's, it's not very complicated, it's because uh, we have changed, uh, replaced T, the uh, line tension, with the appropriate uh, formula. But at the end of the day, in practice, so we don't have epsilon, but we have delta to the power three halves and the important uh, factor, uh, square root of volume fraction times particle uh, dimension. So, and you can, uh, you know, using this theory, also determine what will be the maximum, the peak stress, yes, and at which radius you'll have this peak stress. Hmm? If you go through, uh, ever go through uh, analysis of this coherency hardening mechanism, yes, hmm? um, you, will, um, you will see that there are different theories. None of these theories is m more correct than the other one. They just use different approaches to solve the problem, in particular with the geometry, how they average the, because this is a macroscopic value, yes, it's what you measure in a tensile test, for instance. Um, so you need to, uh, to average out 
uh, the effects of a distribution of particles on a distribution of this location. So you do get parameters that may differ. Yeah? For instance, here, in, 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 uh, although most theories ag agree with this part of the formula, this factor here, this numerical factor, may, you know, may vary. Slightly less than two to three, yes? So that will impact um, uh, the results these formulas give, yeah? But again, the, the idea is, is uh, uh, you can use the formulas to guide you, yes, uh, to what's important to do, yes, uh, but in, in practice, you, use, you work in the reverse, right? You, you do measurements, and then you see what is the hardening mechanism, yes? What is the hardening, what's the operating hardening mechanism, yes? And then you apply these formulas to your data to see which one uh, fits the uh, situation. The chemical hardening effect hmm, is, is basically due to the following. You have this location passes the particle, yes? It will shear the particle, yes? And when it's finished shearing the particle, you can see here and here I've, I've created new interfaces, new interfaces. And these interfaces have, um, um, have energy, right? So the creation of this interface is what causes the, uh, the uh, uh, effect of the, uh, the restraining effect, the obstacle effect of the particle on the dislocations, yes? Um, so, well, uh, if this uh, p uh, particle has a special ordered structure, this shearing may cause the, uh, the formation of an anti-phase boundary. And then we have to take care of that. But in this case, um, we assume that the particle is not ordered, yes? You basically shear the particle and you form these two surfaces, yes? Okay, so if you, if you uh, do the theory, the maximum uh, force, interaction force, is proportional to the energy of these interfaces. Makes sense, right? Um, and the, uh, the chemical hardening effect can be calculated, and the theory gives chemical hardening effect is, again, the maximum interaction force to the power three halves, yes? So uh, as the maximum interaction force is proportional to this uh, surface energy, uh, you, that's what you find here. It's proportional to the square root of F, and oddly enough, it's, one, it's proportional to one over the particle radius, okay? So, so the theory predicts that, um, so if you have fixed F, the strengthening will decrease with uh, precipitate size. And this is not, uh, this not observed in age hardening. So that part of that, the impact of this process on uh, the hardening is probably minimal because we never observe this uh, this effect that the particle gets larger and we it's, the stuff gets softer yes so um, so that mechanism is probably unlikely to uh, to be of any importance hmm? for instance for instance you could have thought that when you shear these copper particles the creation of these interfaces might cause the strengthening well obviously that's not the case yeah? because we don't observe a decrease in the, the strengthening with the radius of the particles, okay? And another strengthening effect is, it takes into account the fact that in certain alloy systems, we have low stacking fault energies, so we have dissociated dislocations, yes? Mm -hmm. And uh, the stacking fault strengthening is in fact due to the difference in the stacking fault energy between precipitate and matrix, okay? Maximum interaction force is proportional to this difference, yes? So as a consequence, the strengthening effect is proportional to the stacking fault energy difference to the power three halves. And 
as expected for age hardening and or precipitation hardening, it's also proportional to the volume fraction and the radius of the particle, the square root of that. Okay. Okay. So so. Uh, Right, so that's, that's, that's a possible situation that, ca that can occur. Um, an important, however, in practice, right, um, uh, an uh, uh, for precipitation hardened alloys, yes, uh, uh, order hardening often occurs. Hmm? So th that's when dislocations glide and they cut through particles which are ordered particles you will create a lattice disorder and the formation of anti-phase boundaries, yes? And there's a very important group of uh, FCC metals and alloys, which are um, iron-based or nickel-based or cobalt-based, which are based on this precipitation hardening model. So, so this is... Uh, for instance, the A2 structure, hmm? so BCC iron, for instance, right? So if I look along the 110 uh, uh, direction, yes, and I shear the lattice on a 112 plane, yes, I shear it over a Burgess vector, A upon 2, 111. Uh, this is before shear, and this is after shear. And uh, what's What's to say? Well, nothing, right? I, after the dislocation has passed, I still have perfect, perfect lattice. Yes. Now, if if now I, I look at the cesium chloride or B2 structure of nickel, uh, of iron aluminum, for instance, hmm? Hmm? and I shear this lattice, then I do not get the same structure. Of course, I, I have the same structure here and here, but where the shear happened, it does not look the same. For instance, um, there are no uh, uh, dark atoms here, large dark atoms that are so close to each other normally in the lattice. Yes? So I created what's called an anti-phase boundary. It's not a stacking fault. Yes? It's, it's anti-phase boundary. So, um, right, so, so, so the same situation as what I, I showed for uh, chemical hardening, the dislocation passes through the particle, and at the interface, we create an interface boundary, and that has a certain energy. So that would be, for instance, I have glide here on FCC on this plane, yes, and it means that after the passage of the dislocation through, for instance, a nickel-3 aluminum particle, yes, on this plane, I create an anti a high energy anti-phase boundary. Hmm? It's similar to a stacking fault, but it's not a stacking fault, okay? Because in the stacking fault, across the stacking fault, you still have normal stacking. And the atoms across the stacking faults are, you know, where they're supposed to be if you look at any uh, 2111 planes in the lattice, right? It's just the stacking is it's odd, yes? In this case, you have at the boundary, there's just the wrong atoms across the boundary, right? So high energies, much higher energies, anti-phase boundary, much higher energies than stacking faults. Yeah? High energies. Hmm? So uh, obviously, the maximum force that we get is proportional to this uh, anti-phase uh, 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 boundary energy, yes, and uh, and of course, if I compute the uh, the strengthening effect, I find again the anti-phase boundary energy to the power three halves times our well-known square root f times R p uh, relation. Yes, so and and this is an example here where this theoretical equation is used in practice. Um, but you, you get the same, basically the, the, the same um, behavior, um, yes? So very important here, uh, very well-known system is the so-called gamma-gamma prime um, system, 
in iron-based superalloys. Yes, and it's it's very similar to the nickel-based superalloys. It's they're very similar. Yeah. All right. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, these um, how we make these this type of precipitates in um, in superalloys. Uh, first of all, uh, really uh, important here. Yeah. Um, in gamma uh, FCC uh, structure, our, we do precipitation hardening with nickel-3 aluminum. Yes? Nickel-3 aluminum. Yeah. That precipitate is formed in the matrix. Yes? Okay? And you can see it requires nickel. All right? Nickel-3 titanium, yes, which you could form, for instance, by adding um, to an austenitic steel, yes, uh, titanium is a similar precipitate, but it's, it doesn't form in the matrix. It forms in grain boundaries, yes? So this is not, you, you have to have the right precipitate, yeah? It has to form in the matrix, otherwise I don't get precipitation. It's the same thing. In BCC alloys, in BCC alloys, we don't really use much precipitation hardening in, in the BCC alloys themselves, but in martensitic steels, we do use it, yes? And here we use FEAL, yes? Because it forms in the matrix, yes? Uh, there are other, you can form other precipitates. For instance, if you add some nickel and mo uh, molybdenum to these alloys, you can form nickel-3 molybdenum. These are, f are in the grain boundaries. Yes. Now, does this mean that we always avoid these, these particles that are in the grain boundaries? No. Because sometimes, for instance, if we have applications at high temperatures, we want to have particles in the matrix, which give me precipitation hardening, and we want to have particles in the grain boundaries, which will prevent grain growth. Remember? Grain size is also a strengthening mechanism, right? So particles in the grain are not necessarily bad, right? Cert as I said, certainly in high temperature applications. OK, so, um, so let's look at what, how we work with, because precipitation strengthening is not very common in ferritic steels, yes? We, yeah, we don't use age hardening in ferritic steel. Age hardening is very common in aluminum, yes, because, uh, uh, because that's a very efficient way to harden the microstructure. But in steels, in particularly ferritic steels, we don't use age hardening yeah. um, so much. But in stainless steel, it's a different story. Yeah. So um, we have, for instance, martensitic uh, steels. And so there's a well-known 17.4. PH is precipitation hardened steel. This is a very common precipitation hardened steel. It has an MS temperature at 132 uh, degrees C. So I can austenitize this steel, which contains 17%, by the way, 17% of uh, chrome, 4% of nickel. Yes. And if I cool it down quickly enough, I form martens a martensitic steel. Hmm? Martensitic steel, which I can then, so I get quenched martensite. Uh, which may be soft uh, generally because it doesn't have much carbon. And then I reheat it, yes, to uh, 500 to 600 degrees C. And there I can do precipitation hardening of my martensite. Yeah? With austenitic steels, it's a bit different. Yes? So let's first, before I, I uh, talk about semi austenitics, let's let look at the. Is, the austenitic uh, precipitation hardened steel. Those are very stable austenitic steels. So they're always austenitic, yes? So do you have to do the precipitation in the austenite. Hmm? So you reheat this material, yes? And then you cool it down to room temperature. Nothing happens, right? It's austenite before and after, you just anneal the material, OK? And why, why does nothing happen? Because the MS temperature is far below room temperature. So I do then aging, precipitation hardening, for a long time, because everything is very slow in austenite, yes? 
and I precipitate things like nickel-3 aluminum, yes? In that microstructure. But um, the structure remains fully austenitic, and I get slow precipitation of, for instance, nickel-3 aluminum in the austenite. Okay? It's a phase diagram here, uh, which, which tells you uh, typically um, uh, in, in, in terms of the, um, the processing of these materials, uh, people have done very clever uh, uh, engineering of the, um, the, st the, the, the structure of these intermetallic compounds. Yes. And what, what the, 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 for instance, the 25 nickel, 15% chromium um, super alloys we use, so that's, that's gamma uh, pure alloys, we use, we actually use titanium and aluminum to, f to have a mixture of nickel-3 titanium and nickel-3 aluminum titanium, yes, to get the right properties. Hmm? All right. Okay, and, and this is an example here, what you get with these uh, alloys. Uh, they're ordered alloys, right? So they have a, this uh, L12 structure, yes? And, um, and, and you see the strengthening uh, uh, effect here, precipitation strengthening. So at first, as the particles grow, I reach the peak strengthening. And after that, yes, when the particles get larger, I get bypassing. And I can, you can see the bypassing here. This is a TM picture. For instance, look at this particle here. You can see the dislocation loops around the particles, yes? And you can see that uh, these are large particles, right? They're, they're far larger than the five nanometers that give me the peak aging uh, uh, value. OK, this is, this is the same here, an austenitic uh, super uh, alloy. This is a very uh, common one, A286, yes? So high nickel, high chrome, yes? And you see here again, uh, peak aging, you need long times for aging, and then a drop. The, the, the size of the particles at peak aging is again, as you can see, uh, precipitate radius, about five nanometers. So these are very, very tiny particles, yes? Let me go back now to this here. We also have semi-austenitic uh, precipitation hardened stainless steels. Those are a little bit more complex, yes, in terms of the, um, uh, the way you, you do the aging. Hmm? So um, the, uh, normally, the MS temperature is, is below uh, room temperature. So you can, you can anneal this material and shape it. Yes, it's important. You can shape it. Yes? And, then you can pres uh, and then you can change the location of the MS temperature. Yes? by, by the, uh, uh, the choice of the annealing temperature. So if you do a high annealing temperature, yes, you don't precipitate much carbon. Hmm? When you do that, yes, so annealing at high temperature, the, you, you know the MS temperature is a function of the carbon content of austenite. So if I have a lot of carbon, I have very low MS. Yes? Okay, so if I precipitate a little bit of carbon, the MS temperature in the case of one will increase a little bit. In the case of two, yes, where I form uh, precipitates, the MS temperature can go up to and beyond room temperature. So that after heat treating two, yes, I will form a fully martensitic microstructure. In the case of one, if I want to form a fully martensitic microstructure, I have to do cryogenic cooling. Yes? Cooling below like with, with the cooler, like liquid nitrogen or, yeah? And then I can do uh, these steels and usually get an actual aging treatment uh, after that to, to form the, uh, the, the precipitates, yes? Okay. So it's, it's precipitation hardening is complex heat treatments, okay? 
All right. So these are examples that I showed. Um, right. Um, you can have ferritic H-hardenable steels. This is an example here for uh, uh, Fe2 titanium silicon uh, precipitation hardened uh, steel, some data. Again, the maximum, uh, the peak aging is always for particles that are very, very tiny in dimensions. Yeah. And we have some more here for BCC steels. And so you, you can just have a look at it. And I just wanted to uh, get to this slide. Um, that is, uh, what, what do you do when you have a combination of, of hardening mechanisms in the same precipitation hardening? Hmm? For instance, you have a gamma prime precipitate in austenite. Yeah? So you, we know when it cuts this, uh, I form anti-phase boundaries. So anti-phase boundaries effects will impact. But that particle itself, yes, also has coherency strengths, yes? So there is also a coherency strengthening effect, yes? So if you want to have an idea of you know, what's the contribution of one hardening effect and the other one, yes, if they both occur, how do I add them together? Do I, for instance, say I have one mechanism one, yes, which gives me a contribution uh, tau one and another mechanism gives me a contribution tau two, do I sum the two or what? Well, um, there are theoretical uh, reasons why the best way of adding the effects is using um, the Pythagoras average. So you take the square of the first one, hardening, contribution, square of this, the second one, take the square root of those, yes? That gives you a value that's close to um, what you can expect. Hmm? And, and then an example, and that holds for this gamma prime precipitates, is, uh, mechanism one would be coherency strains, and mechanism two would be order strains, for instance, due to uh, order hardening, uh, due to uh, anti-phase boundaries. Okay, a little bit over time. Um, so uh, I'll stop here. I will uh, continue Monday, mo uh, Tuesday morning, excuse me, uh, about the um, uh, precipitation of nitrites and carbides. And then we'll, we'll start probably already on Monday the, um, the last chapter, which is about microstructural uh, hardening. How, how you strengthen uh, steels by using multi-phase microstructures. Okay? See you on Tuesday morning.